Uh, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening. My name is John Cohen. I'm a um, staff writer with Science Magazine, and I have covered HIV AIDS for more than 30 years. Um, we are going to be talking about science and the intersection of HIV and COVID-19. And there are uh, interpretation channels at the bottom in Spanish, French, and English. Uh, we will open up for questions, uh, and now we're going to have an introduction from Dr. Tony Fauci, who needs a little introduction, but he's the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and following his introductory remarks, we're going to meet with our six panelists one by one, and then we'll have a discussion, and you can ask some questions. Thanks for joining us. Warm greetings to you all. My name is Tony Fauci, and I'm the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the chief medical advisor to President Biden. I am very pleased to have been invited to speak about the science-driven response to the twin pandemics of HIV and COVID-19 and to highlight how lessons drawn from this response can guide our future efforts. To start, I want to thank UNAIDS, WHO, the World Bank, and the Africa CDC for providing this opportunity with the hope that it will lead all of us to take ever more concerted action in the future. Over the years, I have had the privilege of pay playing a role in guiding the research response to multiple disease outbreaks and two global pandemics, both of which are still in progress, HIV AIDS and COVID-19. These pandemics are among the most daunting health and social challenges ever faced by humankind, and they are teaching us somewhat similar lessons. To help open this meeting, I will briefly outline some of the key lessons I believe we have learned. Whether the focus is on discovery of interventions, translation of study findings into practice, or community engagement, good science is essential to inform all these efforts, the core requirements for effective pandemic preparedness and response. First, both AIDS and COVID-19 have taught us that long-term investments, both in disease surveillance and basic biomedical research, are essential to responding to emergent diseases. In the more insidious and slow-moving HIV pandemic, vaccines have proven elusive. However, effective therapeutic interventions have dramatically reduced mortality and slowed viral transmission. With the more explosive COVID-19 pandemic, the discovery of effective vaccines with unprecedented speed was made possible by the rapid identification of the causative pathogen and by decades of prior research investment in basic virology and immunology, vaccine platform development, and studies of coronavirus molecular and structural biology. The lesson in this is that countries and international entities must prioritize the expansion of research and research capacity throughout the world if we are to rapidly characterize and effectively respond to emerging infectious disease threats. Second, both pandemics have demonstrated the value of international collaboration to support well-designed clinical trials that can rapidly enroll diverse populations and yield useful data. Such trials have been essential to the registration and use 
of therapeutics and vaccines in multiple countries and through the WHO pre-qualification process. Of course, to be valid and credible, trials must be sufficiently powered, carefully managed and monitored, appropriately analyzed, and subject to rigorous, transparent peer review. Trials that do not meet these standards ultimately are a waste of resources and have the potential for significant misinterpretation. Therefore, it is incumbent on all of us to assure our scientists that they have the support they need to produce results that inspire public and professional confidence. Particularly in response to COVID-19, we also have learned the life-saving value of enabling research efficiency and speed. Impactful science has relied on the open sharing of biological materials and data, including sera, viral, isolates, and genetic sequence data. In addition, urgent COVID-19 research has benefited from streamlined regulatory approval, timely safety and monitoring review, a ready supply of research reagents, and reliable supply chains enhanced by expedited export-import processes. By focusing on improving these essential factors now, before the next pandemic, we can set the stage for future research success. We also must acknowledge that public-private scientific partnerships have had a profound impact on the discovery, evaluation, and availability of medical countermeasures in both pandemics. Without the long-term collaborative engagement of pharma and biotech companies, in addition to continuing government investments, we would not have the array of HIV therapeutics that have transformed the medical management of HIV infections. Similarly, without the participation of pharmaceutical company facilities and scientists, along with generous government funding and the discoveries of academic and government investigators, we would not have multiple SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that are available today. Moving forward, we must encourage such mutually beneficial public-private collaborations while also addressing the need to assure equitable access to products that result from public sector capital and intellectual investment. Which brings me to my next point, where the lessons of HIV and SARS-CoV-2 intersect. Both pandemics have reminded us that the public support is essential for research success and for the effective uptake of public health and clinical interventions. This support requires that we focus on building trust in science and explaining how knowledge evolves through the accumulation of reliable data which can alter clinical and public health guidance. It also requires that we reach all sectors of our local and global communities, particularly those that are skeptical disadvantaged, or historically exploited. COVID-19 has reminded us that an effective pandemic response must address the importance of healthcare access, social bias, and intervention pricings, as well as other economic factors. Finally, I want to emphasize the importance of traditional and social media communications and our duty to ensure that the public receives evidence-based information from health officials and political leadership. As we all know from AIDS and COVID-19, public health interventions are the most important determinants of pandemic control. Nevertheless, it has sometimes proven very difficult to achieve broad uptake of these interventions. For example, in the United States, a failure to adopt effective behavioral prevention practices in some communities 
has led to a plateauing of HIV incidence at a disturbingly high level, even with the wide availability of antiretroviral drugs used as pre-exposure prophylaxis to reduce transmission. Similarly, without the widespread use of masks and other public health measures, we have seen recurring waves of SARS-CoV-2 infection and suboptimal uptake of COVID-19 vaccines, even when they are readily available. In this regard, WHO and the other sponsors of this meeting can and should play a major role in spreading the word about the safety and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines. However, we also must recognize that the most trusted voices are often those closest to the community. And so engaging local opinion leaders and other influencers must be one of our key future responsibilities. Going forward, we can again turn to HIV AIDS to consider how the world might best respond to COVID-19 to control and reduce the impact of AIDS national, regional, and international programs were established, including PEPFOL, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Malaria, and TB, UNAIDS, and many others. In response to COVID-19, we are called on to respond with urgency, informed by our knowledge of coronaviruses and other pathogens with pandemic potential, as well as the need to limit economic and social harm. In the scientific and research arena, we need to expand collective and national efforts to enhance surveillance, research capacity, clinical trial networks, and communications. Of course, all this will require substantial national and international funding. These are not simple objectives but we have learned that they are essential as we prepare for the research response to future pandemics. The United States is prepared to play our role as a global leader and a reliable partner in science-driven pandemic preparedness and response. Everyone gathered here is making similar commitments and as meetings like this lead to program commitments and sustained collaboration, we may someday find that these world-changing pandemics and the scientific efforts they have generated will provide long-term benefits that strengthen our global community. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today, and thank you all for your good work. Well, that was a good overview, and we're now going to switch to our panelists. Um, I have had the good fortune of knowing uh, most of these panelists for many years. These are people in my work family. Uh, we're going to begin with um, Sumya Swaminathan, who is the chief scientist at the World Health Organization. I met Sumya in 2004 in Chennai when she was a modest uh, tuberculosis doctor running a TB clinic and spent a day with her watching her um, treat patients at a time when there were virtually no antiretrovirals in India to treat anyone. And it was a, a horrific time. And I went to the hospital Tambaram next to where she worked that to this day uh, is one of the most devastating examples I've ever seen of inequity and access with huge rooms filled with people dying from AIDS at a time when antiretrovirals had been around uh, since 1996. So um, Sumya, um, Dr. Fauci just mentioned clinical trials and their quality. And I, I, I wonder what we can learn from HIV trials and the COVID-19 trials and WHO has been very involved with helping to run trials through the Solidarity Network. And I think we've also seen a lot of trials that don't give us information we need. 
I think we saw that with HIV as well. What, 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 do, what do you think and how do we improve on that? Thank you, John. And uh, yes, I think those days, uh, pre-2004, when antiretrovirals became available through the public sector in India, uh, are very painful. I have very painful memories of, of many of my patients actually dying uh, while being aware that these treatments were available in other parts of the world. And somehow, you know, I can't help thinking we're in a similar situation today where some countries are vaccinating children with COVID vaccines and other countries still have not vaccinated their frontline workers. It, it's, a, it's a very tragic situation to be in and hopefully it would change soon. But going back to clinical trials, I think, you know, what is key is some kind of uh, a globally uh, coherent uh, and considered and collaborative approach, especially when it concerns uh, a pandemic or uh, a disease of public health, of global public health importance. Uh, it doesn't just have to be infectious diseases like TB or HIV or COVID. It could also be things like hypertension where you want to advance the field, where there's limited, of course, in setting those research priorities, in bringing people together and convening experts, also in developing you know, what we call the target product profiles for treatments or for vaccines. I think this normative role of WHO is key, but then we have to go beyond that and really think about the most efficient way to do clinical trials. Of course, particularly in emergency where you want to get information as quickly as possible, for example, when we started with the repurposed drugs last year uh, and set up the solidarity trial, it was because we found that there, were a, there was a proliferation of thousands of small trials, none of which were able to answer the question of whether or not hydroxychloroquine or lopinavir ritonavir was an effective drug to treat COVID-19 or not. The other thing that happened, of course, was that everybody was focusing on the hospitalized and most severely ill patients, which I think was natural, but research on outpatients on earlier treatments has lagged behind. We could have done better, I think, if we'd had a platform, if we'd already had pre-existing platform trials uh, or trial networks that had come together at that time, had a common uh, methodology for prioritization, had collaborations between themselves to um, uh, decide who was going to test which drug, to decide on endpoints and case definitions, because again, we end up not being able to compare apples with apples, and then ultimately also to share uh, the data. So we've been, I would say, we've had limited success in that, in, in launching prospective meta-analyses, bringing together principal investigators who are studying steroids or who are studying antithrombotics or IL-6 inhibitors with a goal to gathering all of that data, doing these prospective meta-analyses to inform the best, uh, you know, highest quality evidence for the treatment guidelines, which can then be, uh, which can then be updated from time to time as, as new evidence comes in. So I think we've not done badly in this pandemic in terms of advancing the science, but we could have done better and should do better. And we should learn lessons particularly for diseases like tuberculosis. It's, it strikes me that one of the big challenges is using treatments in COVID-19 early, which is also a big challenge in HIV. Um, but with HIV, there's a much longer window for the definition of early. And you know, we see with COVID-19, monoclonal antibodies, for example, uh, have received emergency use authorization in the United States. They seem to work, but they seem to work best early on. Do you see us moving to a point where there's globally early treatment with COVID-19? And how does, we can hardly do it in the United States. And I just wonder globally, how, do, how are we gonna get there? So testing and treatment have to go hand in hand. And as you rightly pointed out, we've seen now from results of zero prevalence studies in Sub-Saharan Africa, that there's a huge gap between the number of people who've actually been exposed and who are turning out to be zero positive. I think for something like 20% now for Sub-Saharan Africa, which is quite very surprising if you really think about the number of people who've been identified and reported. Uh, and luckily, you know, fewer people, very few people have died maybe because of the demographics. So when there isn't testing, obviously there cannot be uh, treatment. 
And I remember the same for HIV as well, particularly, you know, before we had the rapid tests, it was very difficult. You had to first do an ELISA, then you had to do a confirmatory test with Western blot and um, only a few labs could do that. We went through the same thing for perinatal uh, and neonatal HIV diagnosis. So as I think as a global community, we've neglected diagnostics. And this question that you ask brings back that uh, need to focus also on developing easy point of care, affordable diagnostics, which can then be linked with treatment. The other thing of course, is that once you have a treatment, it motivates people to get tested. You know, when HIV was a death sentence, there wasn't a huge motivation for people to get tested. But the moment antiretrovirals became available, you could tell people, well, you can live a relatively normal life if you are tested and start treatment early. So it also has, I think, that, uh, that uh, effect. But I think the lack of our uh, of innovation and, uh, and particularly the lack of, of uh, diagnostic platforms in primary healthcare centers in most developing countries around the world is a huge impediment, not only to COVID treatment, but also for other uh, common infectious diseases. Just a last quick question. In the new UNAIDS report, it shows a steep drop-off in HIV diagnostics of testing during the pandemic. And uh, Dr. Swami Nathan, you and I both were just in India as during the surge. And did you hear from your colleagues that there has been a steep drop-off in HIV testing in India? because of the pandemic? There was, there was a significant drop off in HIV testing. There was also a, a huge drop in TB testing, which, which then recovered. Uh, but globally, we know that there were 40%, uh, uh, I'm sorry, about a 22% less detection of TB in 2020 compared to 2019. So 5.1 million cases reported uh, instead of 6.8 million from the uh, 70 uh, uh, countries that reported. So both TB and HIV have been impacted. I think supply chains and drugs have also been impacted. Um, and uh, key populations, particularly, I think, that are already sort of hidden, stigmatized, and find it difficult to access health services, I think were most uh, impacted by the pandemic. Many of them, you know, have lost uh, livelihoods. Uh, sex workers, for example, have been very badly impacted. So I think the combined effect of all of this is going to be very uh, detrimental. And we're probably going to see that uh, uh, in the coming years, because of course, data systems have also been impacted. And you know, we, we really don't know, I think the full impact that this mm -hmm. pandemic has had on, um, on other infectious diseases like HIV. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, Karisha Abdul Karim who is the scientific, uh, Associate Scientific Director at Caprisa in uh, Durban, South Africa. I met Karisha in 2000, and we drove from Durban to a very remote part of KwaZulu-Natal called Shlavisa to see if people in villages there were interested in participating in HIV vaccine trials. This was at a time when uh, the president of South Africa Tabo Mbeki was questioning whether HIV even caused AIDS. So it was quite a confusing time. And it was, I, I think, when I think back, it's kind of remarkable that the question being asked was such a simple question. Do, do you want to participate in trials? And South Africa subsequently has become a central place in the world for conducting HIV vaccine trials, as well as COVID-19 vaccine trials. So Karisha, it's good to see you again. I'm, I'm curious at, at this point, what you see of the overlap between vaccine trial testing in South Africa, uh, you know, which in 2000, it really wasn't a place that the world turned to, to evaluate vaccines for the world, but it has become that over the past 21 years, in my mind anyway. And I'm curious how you see that evolution and the role that it's now playing. Greetings, John, and uh, good to see you. Yeah, it's been uh, a really long journey that we've traveled together. I also want to greet the other participants and thank the organizers for the opportunity to be part of this um, amazing and illustrious uh, panel. And you're right, John, when uh, we think about um, not so long ago, two decades ago almost, 
the capacity to undertake clinical trials in Africa was quite limited. And the investments that were made in uh, through HIV, both treatment and prevention programs, have really created an important platform for uh, rapidly pivoting uh, to undertake not only HIV prevention and therapeutics research, but also TB research, and uh, now more recently COVID-19. But I think an important part, and, and of course, South Africa has participated uh, in at least six of the eight uh, COVID um, uh, vaccine trials. But uh, our participation in the trials have highlighted two things. One is the importance of these diverse uh, platforms across the globe. And uh, Dr. Fauci spoke about the investments that need to be made um, even as we deal with the, the current uh, slate of um, epidemics and pandemics and in anticipation and preparation for the future. But what we've also seen is that participation in these trials are no guarantee for access. Um, we've seen that quite acutely with COVID-19 where despite Africa's participation in the trials, less than 2% of the population of Africa has access to the vaccines. This is an unacceptable situation in this day and age. And so as we participate in trials and we think about knowledge generation and co-creation of knowledge, we also have to be part of um, addressing the access issues one, but I think also that Africa has to be investing a lot more in terms of building the capacity upfront to lead some of the vaccine development work and manufacturing. So if we just do trials and don't do the upfront investments and don't um, sort out post-trial access, then to me, it's a meaningless thing. And I, I just wanted to underscore two other points that we made around that as we deal with these multiple pandemics, um, it reminds us of our interconnectedness and also our vulnerabilities. And that when we collaborate between countries, within countries, we can achieve a lot. And that uh, those partnerships uh, are not just bilateral uh, or multilateral agreements at a political level, that they also need to engage and involve affected communities. And that we've seen over and over again how uh, community leadership, community partnerships, community ownership, and at the end of the day, we can't really do these trials. We cannot enroll the numbers we need to be enrolling, the right participants in trials, if we don't have good uh, partnerships and uh, relationships with community. In HIV, we've seen that nexus between science and activism and how that has spearheaded things. Um, I think, you know, uh, as we think about randomized controlled trials, uh, there are other things we also need to focus on. We've seen how strategic information is so uh, critically in important. It helps us understand the diversity of epidemics within and between countries, populations that are being reached, populations that are not being reached and being left behind. And an important um, advance more recently has been around the omic space and where, for example, phylogenetics and molecular surveillance has really enhanced our understanding of HIV. And as we've seen with COVID on uh, variants of concern. And so these variants of concern has really challenged us again with SARS-CoV-2, that you can have vaccines, you can have therapeutics, but if we're not monitoring um, the evolving epidemic very carefully, we don't have the diagnostics, access to the diagnostics and access to the therapeutics and, and prophylactics that we have, uh, we can't start to alter trajectories as we would like to. That's terrific. I wanna to return to some of the questions, some of the issues you just raised, and uh, let's get back to that in a minute. Um, but Karisha, hold on to this thought. We. You received a standing ovation years ago at an AIDS conference when you uh, reported the first evidence of pre-exposure prophylaxis working 
in uh, women in, uh, in, in HIV. So let's return to that later and talk about where, how has that progressed or how hasn't it progressed in South Africa and elsewhere. Um, let's move on to um, someone I have never met before, uh, but it's a pleasure to meet you. And I hope I don't butcher your name, Lois Maturu. Um, and you are from Harare, uh, which I was uh, fortunate enough to visit in 2015 during the ECASA meeting. Um, and um, Lois, I'd like you to tell us about um, younger people in Zimbabwe and HIV. How, how is it, uh, there's always a, an evolution of the way HIV is perceived in communities. And when, when I was in Zimbabwe in 2015, um, it was very challenging for the country to even host that ICASA meeting because of politics and the president at the time uh, having issues with men who have sex with men and other marginalized groups. Um, how, do, how do you see things now in um, your age bracket and your friends with HIV now in Zimbabwe and how are things changing? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for the question. And it's such an honor for me uh, being part uh, of such an important conversation when it comes to uh, science, um, children, adolescents, and young people. Uh, let me say that uh, it has been an amazing journey and um, an emotional journey as well over the past 12 years, um, advocating on behalf of my peers who are living with HIV. And science have played a huge, huge role. Um, however, we still have a long way uh, to go in addressing that. And in terms of Zimbabwe, what I want to say is that Zimbabwe um, has come uh, from a long journey where things have been bad, but I'm really, really happy that we have uh, done a lot of work in terms of improving the lives of children and adolescents who are living with HIV. And I'm happy to say I am also one of the statistics and the face behind the statistics that Zimbabwe have achieved over the years. And in 2004, when I was just 12 years, uh, that's when I found out that I had HIV after severely getting sick and I had to stop school for some uh, months and getting to learn about my HIV status. I thought I was going to die just like how my mother and my younger brother had passed away due to AIDS related illnesses. Uh, but here I am today looking healthy uh, very bold and beautiful and a very empowered young uh, women. And this is because of the amazing science um, that have been happening, the amazing research. Um, and uh, let me also say that psychosocial support have played an important and tremendous role in my life, including the lives of uh, children and adolescents and young people living with HIV. And it has made me realize that research, um, uh, it made me realize that science alone is not enough. Science um, and evidence-based community peer support interventions complement each other for improved health care uh, among children, adolescents, and young people. So one of my key um, uh, my key message is that research should be uh, driven by community voices, and community voices uh, or community myself and my peers should not only be considered as end users uh, uh, of such interventions, but also be decision makers. Uh, in terms of how research and science should be driven in the initial planning up to the implementation um, uh, process at country level. And this helps in terms of the success of science and um, 
the outcome um, of that. I think that's uh, what I can say at the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lois. Um, so we'll move on, to, we'll come back to Lois and others after we get through uh, the rest of our panelists introducing themselves and asking a few questions. Uh, moving on to Greg Millett, who is the Vice President and Director of Public Policy at AMFAR. Um, Greg is another one of my professors who I've known for many years. Uh, Greg, uh, when he was with the CDC and with uh, the White House uh, working on AIDS programs was a go-to person for me to understand HIV, especially in African-American communities in the United States and in men who have sex with men. And I think one of the um, uh, questions that remains high is about uh, long lasting drugs with HIV injectables used either as preventives or treatments. And the troubling HIV infection rate that remains in men who have sex with men in the United States and in other countries, and whether these longer lasting uh, preventives, longer lasting treatments may help. And, whether they are helping yet. What, what, what do you think, Greg? Sure, hi, hi John, good morning. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here and speaking with you today and seeing other members of the panel. You know, I, I think you're, you're bringing up um, a, a very key question is that um, we have these new injectables um, that have the potential uh, to reduce HIV infections globally among men who have sex with men, but there are still other mitigating factors. Um, one, the, the new injectables are not necessarily available yet, but we do know that when new technologies are introduced, um, that there are some populations that have access to those technologies and others that do not. Um, and it's been very clear that, um, for at least with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that you know, vaccines um, are available in wealthy countries. They're not as available in countries uh, that are low and middle income. Uh, we saw the same thing with ART. We're seeing exactly the same thing right now with PrEP. Um, so that's certainly going to be an issue um, as we move forward to try and get access uh, to some of these new technologies. Another issue as well is there's a yawning difference that we see between um, people who are aware of a technology um, and then once they're aware, willingness uh, to access that technology. So for instance, um, there've been several reviews looking at MSM in low and middle income countries and find that only 30% are aware of pre-exposure prophylaxis, whereas among those who are aware, 64% are willing to use PrEP. Um, and in Europe alone, an estimated 500,000 MSM um, in Europe uh, would should would should, would like to be on prep or are currently not on prep with less than five percent of MSM who are eligible in Europe um, having access to prep. So that's certainly you know some of the issues that we see. I think the other issue as well is the fact that you know many of these populations are still criminalized in various parts of the world uh, and particularly gay bisexual men. And there was a nice review, a systematic review that was published a year and a half ago where they found that criminalization increases HIV risk among men who have sex with men, uh, such that MSM in countries that criminalize homosexuality were twice as likely to have HIV um, and nearly five times as likely to have HIV in those countries that have severe criminalization uh, for men who are homosexually active. Um, and even in those countries that have legal barriers uh, for civil service organizations, um, we saw again, higher rates of HIV. So that's also a barrier to PrEP access because of course, if you're in a country that criminalizes um, MSM activity, then you're probably least likely to access those services, particularly for those clinics that are MSM identified. Um, and you are probably not going to get cultural Culturally tailored care um, when you go to generalized clinics for the general population uh, because you are unwilling to answer some of the specific questions about your partners and some of the risks that you might have. So we still have these lingering barriers, unfortunately, um, that might impact whether or not we realize the goals of having access uh, to injectable PrEP for all populations of MSM globally. How available is injectable PrEP in uh, middle-income and lower-income countries? Is it there? 
uh, well, it's it, it's not currently available right now. Um, you know, we're we're still really trying to get access to daily oral prep um, in um, middle and lower income countries um, at the moment, um, where there are people who are interested uh, but don't necessarily have access. And even when you ask people about um, injectables, you you see a, quite a bit of data where there's enthusiasm um, among MSM populations about the likelihood of injectables. Where we're seeing in many different countries from India to um, South Africa to the US and Australia, um, MSM who are saying that they would like to have access to injectables. But I think one thing that we have to be careful about is that we need to realize that we need to continue to offer a suite of PrEP services um, for men who have sex with men as well as for other key populations. Uh, so, you know, injectables might be perfectly acceptable to some populations. Other populations might want on-demand PrEP. Other populations might want daily oral PrEP. Uh, so we need to make sure that all of those modalities are available for you know, key populations and particularly MSM over the course of their lifetime where they might change from one modality to another. Uh, so you know, as much of a game changer as injectable PrEP might be, particularly for those populations um, that are stigmatized or those populations that might not have as much access to going to a healthcare provider because they might be too far away um, and injectable prep would be ideal. Um, there's still other barriers that, that remain and we, we need to make sure that all types of modalities of prep are, remain available uh, for MSM across the spectrum and in many different countries. Thanks, Greg. I, I wanna build on the criminalization and move on to um, Adiba Kamarulzaman who is the president now of the International AIDS Society She's a clinician at the University of Malaya. I was fortunate enough to visit her in Kuala Lumpur in 2014, and she helped me visit prisons there. Yeah, you're muted still, Adiva. And uh, we, I visited her in the clinic. And criminalization of people who uh, inject uh, drugs uh, remains a huge issue all over the world. And in, in Malaysia in particular, Adiba has very boldly tried to move forward with harm reduction in a, in a country that uh, I would say uh, resisted her efforts <laughs> at times. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm curious how- A little how, bit, a little, a bit. little bit, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious how it is today, Adiba. I think is harm reduction in, in Malaysia uh, being more widely accepted? Are you still fighting the same battles? The evidence is overwhelming that it works and prevents HIV transmission. But you know, you're not alone in Malaysia. It's all over the world, including the United States, where there's been a, a reluctance to accept the evidence. How, how, how is it uh, working now? Hi, John. Good to see you again. And hi, everyone. Well, actually, after 15 years of trying, harm reduction is actually quite well established in Malaysia. And um, we have uh, needle syringe programs and, and methadone programs being taken up um, as national programs, locally funded with some support from the Global Fund. Um, so, and, and, and it's proven um, to dramatically, to have dramatically reduce HIV amongst people who use drugs by, you know, many, many falls. We, we're now only seeing less than 500 new cases per year when we were seeing before harm reduction, 5,000 thereabouts new cases per year um, attributed to injecting drug use. So that, that seems to, to have been accepted. What we're working on now is, of course, um, trying to go one step further and uh, you know, decriminalize drug use because especially at the moment with uh, COVID-19, uh, prisons are uh, terribly overcrowded, um, at least twice more than they should have. And we, like many other prisons around the world, have seen substantial um, COVID-19 outbreaks amongst prisoners. 60% of our prisoners are in there for, for drug use, mostly for non-violent drug use. So uh, we've had... Um, something like, uh, what is it, uh, 20,000 cases of, of COVID-19 and um, staff as well have been affected. So just, just like what Greg was referring to, I think criminalization of, of behaviors um, has been um, 
is uh, probably still uh, the one thing in our HIV response that we have not been able to advance very much. And, and we see the effects of that, at least uh, with respect to drug use, um, how it's now uh, affecting the COVID-19 response. How has COVID-19, how has COVID-19, how has the pandemic impacted uh, drug use and harm reduction efforts? I mean, we, we heard from uh, Sumi, Sumi Swami Nathan about the impact that the pandemic has had on TB and on HIV testing. What impact has it had in the drug using community? Well, I think, you know, thanks to community leaders and outreach workers, um, those uh, programs, and, and, you know, we hear of uh, great examples from all over the world, how committed uh, community organizations have been throughout the lockdown in trying to ensure that clean needles and syringes continue to be distributed to people who need them. Where it's impacted, I think, is in terms of HIV testing, in terms of uh, coming forward for um, initiation of antiretroviral treatment. As we know, um, you know, already even before the HIV, sorry, before the COVID-19 pandemic, um, people who use drugs are pretty much left behind in terms of uh, the, the coverage for antiretroviral and even less so for PrEP. Um, so I think COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has, um, you know, complicated any efforts to increase uh, antiretroviral coverage for people who use drugs, um, and even more so um, with PrEP. Thank you, Diva. Let's move on to um, Hendrik Drake, who is at the University of Bonn in Germany. Hendrik, I, I began working on a book about the search for an AIDS vaccine in 1989. You are that next generation. I imagine you were uh, still living with your parents in 1989. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and we met at Croy, I think, uh, in 2013 when you had some exciting new research. Um, you're still working on cure research, vaccine research. Give, give us an update. Where, where do we stand right now on HIV cure research? It's been uh, one of the biggest challenges science has faced in my lifetime to try to find a cure for HIV. Progress has been incremental, um, but there is no cure. And I don't see one uh, with any kind of crash program as we just saw <laughs> with, pandem with the pandemic. Uh, delivering a cure in the next uh, 12 months. Where, where do we stand? Uh, good to see you, John. Uh, had been a long time now. Um, well, first, let me uh, say that we actually can end the HIV AIDS pandemic with the tools we already have, right? Testing and treating everyone who is living with HIV worldwide is a working strategy to end this pandemic. And over five years ago, UNAIDS had already defined these goals with their 90, 90, 90, or now 95, 95, 95 goals. And these are powerful tools uh, to end the pandemic. Now, of course, a cure would be phenomenal. But currently, it is still, as you just said, an elusive goal. We are, we are however, every day taking baby steps forward towards a cure. Um, uh, two individuals, as many know, are believed to have been cured after really um, harsh chemotherapy and stem cell therapies because of cancer. One of them, the Berlin patient, uh, has recently passed away because of cancer. Um, and other people have been in long-term remission that are living with HIV and AIDS and actually are not needing antiretroviral therapies. Um, I believe, though, that we still haven't understood some fundamental basics of HIV latency to really achieve a cure. Well, for example, where and how is HIV hiding? Um, why can't we actually revert latency? And this is a general question um, that we do not know how to cure chronic viral infections besides HIV. So for various herpes viruses, such as CMV, EBV, herpes simplex one, we just don't know um, how to cure 
that uh, diseases revert latency and eradicate uh, the virus. And while will we have a cure in the upcoming years, I'm hopeful, I, I'm, I just, I'm optimistic, I want to be optimistic, but there's so much science still to do about it. And uh, where do you see the vaccine field today? Well, I think the COVID pandemic has uh, shown us that we can be agile, highly effective and quick in combating a new virus. It was actually in a warp speed that we achieved this in the scientific community together with private companies. And worldwide, eight vaccines have been approved and 30 have reached the final stage of testing. This is unheard of in terms of HIV vaccine. We have in contrast only eight vaccines tested against HIV and AIDS in over 30 years. Imagine where we would stand today if we pulled these human capacities and financial resources just as we did for uh, COVID-19. And um, so I guess the message I like to convey to, uh, here is that with the right resources, the right structures and the governmental support, we now know that we can do better in the fight against HIV and AIDS and to find an effective vaccine. And no doubt, I mean, there's a cross fertilization between the COVID-19 response and HIV and AIDS research. For example, the adenovirus platform uh, uh, is built upon the HIV vaccine uh, trials. So those two vaccines that we have that are working with adenovirus are built on vaccine trials that are uh, tested in HIV and AIDS or currently tested, for example, Mosaico and Imbocoro. And um, also the mRNA platform, on the other hand, represents a very promising approach for the development of the vaccine in the future, not only for HIV, but also for HIV. And I believe that mRNA vaccines are here a game changer in vaccine development not only being effective, but also easy in manufacturing, uh, and that may lead to a transformative change for nations and including also, of course, the developing world. Um, first trials in monkeys actually conducted by the National Institute of Health have already shown some promising results against HIV. It is not that easy as for COVID-19, but it shows again that we actually can do it. And we know that we can be quicker. And most important, we know that we have to keep up the stamina in the scientific community. Terrific. Thanks so much, Hendrik. We move on to our final panelist. It's um, Wafa El Sadr, who is uh, at the uh, Columbia University uh, Mailman School and co leads the HIV Prevention Trials Network. Uh, Wafa, I don't know how long we've known each other. In 2015, Wafa uh, allowed me to join her in Zimbabwe as we went to rural communities to try to, uh, she was trying to uh, help figure out how much HIV was actually in Zimbabwe and where was it with a, the largest um, household study ever done. And Wafa, I'm curious uh, today um, what did we learn from these massive studies you helped organize in Zimbabwe uh, and other neighboring countries about HIV prevalence? And how has what we learned uh, been applied to prevent HIV transmission and to reach people who learn their status to get them treatment? Yeah, uh, which of course for... also prevents HIV spread. Right, 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 exactly. And thank you very much, John, for the opportunity. And uh, I fondly recall that trip uh, to the countryside in uh, in Zimbabwe for the first uh, FIA uh, survey. And uh, I'm just happy to let you know that actually a second survey was done five years later in 2020. So I think these surveys, these large general population surveys, have been very important engaging where the epidemic is at uh, in various countries around the world, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, as well as, of course, in uh, based on the data, then, uh, uh, you know, uh, carving a path forward in terms of where programs should focus and also where resources should be directed. Uh, so, for example, one of the things that have been noted from the first, maybe, you know, surveys that were done in 15 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is often uh, the biggest uh, gap was in the first 90 in knowledge of HIV status. Um, and that has been a very, uh, an eye opener because people before these surveys always thought that 
uh, the gap is likely to be more along the lines of uh, whether people who are on treatment are virally suppressed. So it was a, a bit of a surprise, but, uh, but also a very important piece of information which uh, mobilized efforts to expand testing uh, in many countries because as we know, testing and knowledge of status is the foundation for both treatment and uh, for PrEP and other preventive measures, uh, volunt voluntary medical male circumcision, for example. Uh, in addition, the, uh, the surveys also offered uh, data, not just at a national level, but also at a subnational level. And that also was really important to look at subnational levels and see where HIV prevalence was high and uh, even more importantly, where viral load suppression was low at a population level. Because we know that viral load uh, suppression level is very critically important metric, telling us how much um, uh, potential for transmission there is within a community with individuals who have unsuppressed viral load. And another gap that was identified almost across all of the surveys was that men all, all, you know, almost always lagged again behind women in terms of, particularly in terms of knowledge of HIV status. So I think these surveys were very instrumental in, uh, in dem demystifying or confronting some of the myths, some of the beliefs that uh, we all had and providing data that then guided uh, uh, the policies and programs, both at a national level, but also at subnational level as well. I, I recently was in India and joined teams doing sero surveys for COVID-19, very similar to what I watched you do in Zimbabwe. How important is it going to be to do sero surveys for COVID-19? I think it's really important for a couple of reasons. One is that, uh, as I think uh, Dr. Swaminathan was saying, is that uh, often, um, uh, COVID-19 infections in, in, a, in a largely younger population are asymptomatic. Uh, it, so you, people don't know that they're, uh, they're ill, that they're sick. Uh, so that's one thing, they're asymptomatic, largely because they're a young, healthy population. Uh, the second issue is the, the lack of uh, diagnostic capability in many uh, lower middle income countries around the world, which means again, that even if people have symptoms, they don't have access to testing. So it becomes so important uh, to get a sense of what's happening in a community in, in, or in a society or in a country is the need to do these zero surveys to be able to get a sense of, you know, what is the penetration, what's the burden of, uh, of COVID-19 in these populations uh, because of these two factors that mainly people are largely asymptomatic and also largely don't have access to, um, uh, access to, so to test, to confirmatory testing. Uh, I think knowledge of, of the epidemiology of the spread of SARS-CoV-2 in countries is really, really important as we think about how to confront the current pandemic, uh, but also as we think about uh, the potential for other similar health threats in the future as well. It seems to me that you also have spent a lot of time building networks within countries and internationally with ministries of health, that that's all part of this, right? I mean, you can't just go in and do these massive sero surveys without building that sort of community of trust? I think it's fundamental. And certainly with the FIA surveys, it, it, these surveys are led by the ministries of health. So I think it's really important to stress that. And uh, what we have done at ICAP is to provide the support, the technical support in, in collaboration with CDC, of course, to enable the countries to do these surveys. So I think it's a, and that means that obviously the buy-in is so important from day one, not just at the ministry level, but also the social mobilization um, that needs to happen in a, in a country to be ready uh, to, um, for people to be knowledgeable that the survey is going to happen, to be willing to open the door when there's a knock on their door, when people say we're here, uh, that they know why people are here and they understand that this, uh, that participation is for the collective good it, it may be for their own good that they find out their own HIV status, uh, but it is for the collective good. It's for the benefit of the country overall as each country uh, confronts, uh, confronts HIV. Um, and as you recall, John, in our uh, travel in Zimbabwe, you remember the jingle on the radio uh, that was encouraging the population to uh, open the door when they hear a knock because this is, uh, their participation was so important uh, to the national good. Thank you, Wafa. Lois, uh, building on that, I'm curious about 
trust in the younger uh, generation in Zimbabwe and building trust in people who are living with HIV and the communities you're working with, does it remain an issue uh, for you in, in your work in Zimbabwe? Yes, it does remain um, an issue. And this is where uh, uh, community-based uh, uh, peer support interventions come in to really uh, support and uh, mentor um, uh, adolescents and young people get to realize these issues so that they're able to make informed decision about their own health and um, being empowered in, in, in who they are. And um, let me try uh, start by saying as well, when you look at how HIV uh, has evolved over the years, including community issues have also changed over the years. And um, what I would want to say is that uh, when it comes to young people and adolescents who are living with HIV, HIV medicine have really, really improved from three medicines a day to one medicine a day. And uh, these are really H um, huge efforts that have been done uh, globally. And what we really are looking for is where we have um, injectable HIV medicine where, where it's done once in a month to improve adherence and also to improve uh, in terms of the health outcome, to improve as well uh, issues uh, related to uh, fatigue, including uh, TB medication where up to today, uh, people have to take four to three medicine and it's just a lot and it's, it, it really is, um, something that's uh, a lot for adolescents and young people who are living with HIV. And we have a lot that we can do in terms of uh, research and science and including adolescents and young people in decision-making uh, processes when we want to come up with um, uh, research related to HIV um, uh, and TB. And mental health has really been affecting adolescents and young people over the past years. And um, it's also an area which we also need to focus on and um, supporting, or should I say, uh, including much funding in terms of community-based intervention is we have realized that the world is more focusing on HIV treatment and forgetting retention as retention is the result that we're looking for, which will help us in ending AIDS-related deaths and will also help us in achieving uh, U equals to you because we realize that if someone is uh, taking their HIV med medication correctly and consistent, it will also lead to um, non-HIV infection. So this is also some of the uh, community issues that we also need to consider when we are planning or uh, developing policies or guidelines that will, um, that will uh, lead science and research as we continue in this pandemic. Thanks, Lois. I wanna to return to Dr. Swami Nathan and we, we saw something very tragic in Zimbabwe recently where um, two leading HIV AIDS researchers died from COVID at a time when uh, COVID vaccines had reached most medical doctors where I live. And these were two doctors who had played a prominent role in Zimbabwe. And I'm sure there are many more, but I just happen to know these two. Um, the inequities with HIV um, laid a groundwork and uh, taught the world, I thought, <laughs> and I think many of us thought, uh, how, how badly we respond at times to um, sharing scientific advances. Um, and this time around with COVID and Sumia, you've been very involved with the COVAX facility to try to prevent these inequities, but here we are again. Uh, you know, we, we, we have huge inequities again with COVID-19 vaccines. Why can't we see more progress here? Why does this 
drag on this way when everyone, all of us n knew this lesson. I don't know, uh, John, because you're questioning, I think, human nature and um, the nature of uh, politics, I guess. And um, in a way, the instinct of politicians uh, to first protect their own people. And I suppose, you know, to some extent, one can really understand that, that they have a duty towards their own people. But then when it comes to a pandemic and a global problem, then I think it's very obvious to all of us that you can't solve this problem uh, a country at a time, you know, a, a region at a time. And this, I think, applies to other public health threats we face, uh, in, like, you know, climate change, antimicrobial resistance, you know, TB, HIV. These are global problems and we need a globally agreed framework and uh, a path which is what now I think we're trying to address the world is saying, okay, before the next pandemic, we need to have these rules in place. We need to have a pandemic treaty. But you know, for, for me, we're still in this pandemic. And while we must talk about how to prevent and prepare for the next one, we have to first deal with this. We have to, you know, we still have 10,000 people at least dying every day. We know these death figures are underestimates because many countries are not counting people who are dying of COVID. So 10,000 is just the, the ones that are recorded. Uh, that's far too much. And we know we can prevent deaths by protecting people with vaccines. So it makes, you know, not only moral and ethical sense, but it also makes economic sense. Uh, because again, there's been lots of analyses done to show that if you do not control the, the pandemic in all parts of the world, then variants are likely to emerge. Ultimately, you may have a variant that uh, is able to evade the immune uh, protection generated by vaccines, and then you have to start all over again. But um, for some reason, we're not able, to, uh, not able to convince, well, the leaders and I guess the public to, to share what we have, which is limited. We knew that we would have limited supplies of vaccines and that's why WHO came up with a fair allocation framework that was agreed by all member states on how we can distribute these vaccines in a fair and equitable manner, starting with the most vulnerable, protecting that 3% of every country, then progressively going to 20% of every country and then opening up to the rest of the population. But um, that hasn't worked. Uh, and I don't know what kind of treaty would be needed in, in order to make this a binding, uh, a binding agreement between countries. Perhaps, uh, you know, we have to think a little bit differently. We don't seem to learn from history, uh, unfortunately. So I want to turn to a few of the questions in the chat and uh, Nazrul Janaidi and Ruben Granich are both asking about essentially, how do we get this pandemic to an end? And Karisha, you have played a pioneering role in prep research we also have seen South Africa very aggressively roll out antiretroviral treatments. South Africa also has the largest population of people living with HIV of any country. And uh, my, uh, I did the calculation last night, it's still 20% of the world total. How well is South Africa applying the tools that exist to help end the pandemic, which is going to be, it has to be a combination of prevention and treatment. Thanks very much, uh, John. I think that, uh, you know, I agree with everything you've said in terms of 20% of the population. So let's focus on South Africa. We're one in five uh, people living with HIV uh, are there. And let's understand this uh, epidemic because I think what we have learned is that you have to understand the epidemic at a local level, what's driving it, so that um, your response can be, uh, can be tailored to address it. What we know is that young women, 15 to 24 years, uh, bear the brunt of the pandemic. They get infected five to seven years before men. And so if you take something like treatment as prevention, we, let's look at treatment rollout. We have eight times more women on treatment than men because women utilize health services, not men. So we gotta find the missing men. When we do our community-based surveys, we find the men and we find that only um, one in five know their HIV status. 
what we find when we measure viral load is that 40% of them have viral loads greater than 50,000 copies per mil. So what does that do? One, it's, um, it's not enabling them to benefit from treatment, but two, they become an important source of infection for young women and continue to sustain the cycle of transmission. With PrEP, what we've seen is um, oral PrEP has been adopted for nearly five years, but there are also inequities in terms of access. Uh, this space has been really exciting in terms of how pharma has come in and suddenly we have long acting uh, tablets, injections, and, and also our annual implants, et cetera. But I think it goes back to the inequality lens with which we have to be thinking about pandemics and epidemics across the globe. It's like, who do we leave behind? And the low hanging fruit, you kind of look at it as the glass half full or half empty, are the ones that use your health services. So every time you want to use your health service as a point of entry, you have to think about who you're missing in that. And the people you're missing are the ones that are marginalized, stigmatized, discriminated against. And it's more than biology. It's about societal norms and values and gender power disparities. And unless we start bridging that gap, whether it's with HIV, whether it's with COVID, then we're going to see this ongoing uh, challenge that we have. We reach those who can, and we see the limitations of reaching only those who you can, and the shortcomings of not being inclusive in responses. Thank you. So, Greg, with men who have sex with men, there are similar challenges. Uh, there have been a lot of creative approaches to uh, inform people about uh, HIV, about encouraging them to get in test, to getting tested, informing them about PrEP, informing them about the value of treatment. I've spent a lot of time going out with researchers to things like gay bars or to Shabins in Botswana where people are gathering and meeting. Um, it, are there creative new ways that are being a, uh, applied to help increase uh, knowledge, access, um, of testing and treatment and prevention for men who have sex with men. What are some of the creative things? I mean, you and I years ago talked about going to ball. Uh, you remember this, <laughs> going to the, to the ballroom um, in, in, in men who have sex with men and the party uh, as an intervention place. What's going on now that's new? Because this has just been going on for a very long time where these communities keep having high rates of transmission and the old ways of going about reaching people often don't work. Sure, no, I appreciate the question, John. I mean, we have seen some successes with um, using online platforms to you know, get MSM um, into care, um, as well as to get MSM into PrEP um, and to remain on PrEP. So for instance, there have been some amazing platforms that have been built um, in Asia and Thailand uh, to really you know, address these specific areas where we've seen some effective interventions. I think the other things that have been effective as well is um, you know, self-diagnoses or self-testing. Um, and new platforms for self-testing for MSM, where we're seeing that, that these new platforms where people have an ability to test themselves is bringing in a greater number of people who are undiagnosed um, into care uh, for, for MSM. And, and we are actually seeing some successes. So for instance, um, in the UK, um, just in you know, a two year period, there was a 55% drop in HIV incidence among gay men. Um, and they just reported that last year that new diagnoses in gay men were at their lowest in 20 years. So only eclipsed heterosexuals by 100 cases, just 100 cases in the UK. And we've seen that you know, HIV incidence has fallen by three quarters in Australia. Denmark is showing um, um, decreases in new infections as well among men who have sex as men. And in the US, we're seeing that those areas where there are investments as well as increases in PrEP, we're seeing um, reductions in estimated annual percentage change of um, HIV diagnoses. So we are seeing, you know, even with some of the setbacks, we are seeing some progress that's taking place. Um, and a lot of that progress really is instrumental in having not only 
early diagnosis, um, new diagnosis technologies, but scaling up PrEP as well as scaling up ART. Um, it really is, a you know, where the old is new again. We're back to the combination approach as the approach that seems to be effective. The problem, though, is that we're seeing some of this progress um, in upper income countries, um, and we're not seeing the same progress necessarily in lower and middle income countries for MSM. And given what's taking place with COVID, where we know that it has disrupted services um, across um, countries, whether low or middle income or high income countries, we're not sure whether or not that that might have temporarily derailed some of the progress that we've seen even in um, some of the countries, the wealthier countries, such as the US um, and European countries as well. Thank you. So. Uh John, you're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you, Greg. Um, Adiba Kamarulzaman, you're head of the International AIDS Society now. Uh, I know for uh, many journalists, HIV AIDS has not been an, uh, the topic of concern recently. Who, those of us who cover um, health and medicine, uh, the pandemic has been everything. It's overshadowed most every other disease. How do you uh, see the conversation shifting back to the uh, attention HIV AIDS deserves. It's still um, a very serious uh, pandemic. We don't use that word often for it, but it is a pandemic. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you plan to steer people back to paying attention to HIV AIDS? Yeah, I think, you know, this uh, UN high level meeting hopefully will um, bring the spotlight back onto HIV, at least amongst political leaders. And, and then when, uh, you know, um, they speak to their own, um, you know, countries uh, that hopefully increases some of the um, attention back to, to HIV. We are hosting, um, Henrik and I are co-hosting the, uh, co-chairing the IS Science Conference in July, where um, there will be some more exciting science being discussed uh, at the conference. And, um, you know, that's another avenue that we hope will also help um, bring the spotlight on, onto HIV. And uh, thirdly, I think it's, it's up to all of us here um, uh, in, in the HIV leadership to continue to talk about uh, HIV and to remind everyone that, you know, the, the numbers are still staggering. And uh, what, 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 is, um, um, what is sad is that, you know, we, like has been said many times tonight, um, that we, we have the tools and, and we really um, can uh, move forward to, to end AIDS. So, uh, of course, the immediate um, urgency with COVID-19 is, is drowning everything else, but inshallah, with, with the vaccine, although, yes, we have all the inequity problems, um, uh, we, we, you know, can, can swing it back to uh, HIV. But, you know, um, many have spoken about how um, lessons from the last four decades of HIV can be applied to COVID-19 response. And, and that too, I hope um, that the learning uh, both ways can remind people that HIV is still very much here and now. I think you and Hedrick face a huge challenge with virtual meetings also. I mean, AIDS conferences have been the most remarkable scientific conferences I've ever been to. 20, 30,000 people, communities involved yeah, in a way that, you know, few scientific uh, areas involve communities, affected yeah. communities. The virtual meeting platform, I mean, it just strikes me that that's a huge challenge for you. It is a huge challenge, uh, John, uh, but I'm happy to say that the registration for Berlin has actually been for, for the same time frame um, is as good as uh, the conference that we had in Paris. So I'm optimistic, but you're absolutely right. It, it's not the same, um, you know, the, 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 the networking, the, the meeting of minds, etc. cetera. Um, we're hoping that by Montreal, 
um, you know, summer of next year, we can have, we can be back together again, um, at least um, for as many people as possible. We're preparing for it to be a hybrid conference. So for those where, you know, um, uh, vaccination is still a challenge, um, uh, there, there's still an opportunity to join the conference. Yeah, on the flip side, I think people who, I have not been able to attend the conference because of costs and, and distance um, are coming onto the platform. Yeah. So yeah. there is a little bit of uh, positive in there. So with the few yeah. minutes that are left, I would like to go around and if each of you could briefly give some advice to, to, for the high level meeting that's about to take place. What uh, do the leaders need to do about the science of HIV AIDS? Why don't we start with Wafa? What, what would you? What would be your advice to people attending the high-level meeting and the leadership there? Uh, what do they need to do? What they need to do in terms of the science, um, yes. I think very importantly is that uh, I think what we've learned again and again and again, and as the Adiba said, we sometimes we unfortunately don't take the lessons learned or um, and uh, and and adhere to them, is that we need to have our responses driven by science. Uh, whether that be in terms of um, the new tool to be used, whether it's a vaccine for COVID or whether it's a, uh, or whether it's a, a prep for HIV, is that we have to be anchored in science and be uh, willing to uh, have the policies, but also the programs be informed by the science. I think that's a, a, an important lesson learned from COVID, where every time we've diverted from the science, we've uh, we've made major uh, missteps. I also think that uh, while some people think of science as kind of the biomedical piece of science, I think there's a much broader array of evidence that we have that should also inform policies and programs. Uh, for example, some of the issues that uh, Greg touched on and Lois touched on is uh, uh, we have evidence that uh, discrimination laws and discriminatory laws uh, can have adverse very adverse uh, effects on transmission of HIV. There's evidence to support this. It's not just uh, uh, it's not just because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do uh, to decriminalize uh, uh, the, such behaviors. But also, the evidence tells us that it is because of the science behind this that there is evidence to guide us to saying that we have to do away with criminalization. We have to expand access to vulnerable populations, whether it be youth or uh, key populations and others, because the evidence tells us that this is the way we're gonna get to uh, controlling and uh, ep the HIV epidemic or controlling the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So I think when I use the term science, I think to myself, it's a very broad term in my mind and it's not only the biomedical science. It is the behavioral science. It's the science that we, all the implementation science work that has been done, all of this effort has generated a lot of evidence. Uh, so I would tell people who are uh, policymakers is look to the evidence, look to the evidence where it exists and use that evidence uh, to guide your actions, to guide your policies, and most importantly, to, to guide your actions in terms of programs. Thanks, Martha. Lois, in, in, in about a minute or so, what would you tell the uh, high-level meeting leadership? What do they need to know that you know? Thank you. I guess my key important um, key message would be to make sure that adolescents and young people are also seen as decision, -making, decision uh, makers. Uh, and not only the end users uh, of um, certain interventions, but we need a bottom-up approach when we come up with research or science that has to do with people that are affected uh, and infected uh, with the pandemic. And uh, that research and science should be community-driven um, so that we have a successful uh, implementation of programs for us to end AIDS uh, by, 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 by 2030. Thanks, Lois. Hendrik, what would you uh, advise uh, the people at the top? Well, I think um, the COVID-19 pandemic really has shown us what we can do. 
And um, HIV and AIDS, I think it's, it's a big reminder right now for us that this pandemic isn't over and that it's, it's a global problem and it needs to be a joint mission. And my vision actually uh, for also the science of the future in terms of finding an HIV vaccine would be that to have like a sort of Manhattan Project style um, large hadron collider project with thousands of scientists working together where the scientific publications are not the ultimate goal, but the goal is actually to finding a vaccine or a cure. And so I envision that this is a role for UNAIDS and UNAIDS needs to have the political, technical and financial support to actually run such huge projects, um, uh, bringing, not, uh, bringing on the one hand side the community together and achieving like treatment and 95, 95, 95 goals. But on the other hand, bring the scientists together and really push the envelope for finding an HIV vaccine and cure. So the right resources, the right structures and the government uh, support is needed that we can do better here in the fight against HIV and AIDS as we did for COVID-19. Thanks for that. I, I wrote a book that came out in 2001 that I spent 12 years working on that argued for a Manhattan Project for an AIDS vaccine. I don't think anyone read it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the work speed people read it. Uh, Karisha, what would you, what's the advice that you're gonna give? I'd say, you know, collectively we've accomplished a lot. And that while your focus today is on COVID-19 and getting the economy back on track, et cetera, we simply cannot afford to drop the ball on HIV. And that um, our investments in HIV has enabled us to pivot and respond as rapidly as we did to COVID-19. And now we got to deal with the multiple challenges that face us, include HIV, including HIV, and to simply drop HIV at this stage or not invest, in fact, more in this last mile, it will reverse the gains we've made to date and create an even worse situation. We gotta to learn to work with pandemics together, no half finished pandemics anymore. We got HIV, we got TB, we got malaria, we got Ebola, and we got, to, got some new ones coming along too, and we gotta set the pace right, and this is the right thing to do. Thank you. Greg, what, what's your advice? You're muted, so you have to unmute to give your advice. <laughs> That's my advice. There we go. Um, yeah, you know, my, I, I think my advice is it's fairly simple, and it's one that was mentioned um, at the top of our program, which is, you know, we live in a global world, a global society, um, where, you know, infectious disease goes from one country to another. We're all interrelated. I, I was just actually reading a paper um, looking at MSM diagnoses in France, where most of the diagnoses were from a network of MSM um, from um, um, Holland, from the Netherlands. So, you, you know, it's been very clear with the COVID-19 um, pandemic that, um, um, you know, we're, we're all interrelated that COVID-19 spread so quickly because we are a, a global world and a global platform and we need to work together. It gives even more reason for why we need to work together and collectively uh, to address not only HIV, but COVID-19, HIV, uh, hepatitis C, um, STIs and other diseases as well, that if we work collectively, that we could actually come to common solutions for each one of these issues. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Wafa al Sadr. What's your, what's your advice to the uh, leadership? Oh, I think my advice is, um, it, it's, um, I build on my colleagues and what they said is uh, we are an interconnected world as um, I think Greg just said. And, and I think we can learn from each other. This, this epidemic and HIV pandemic have both taught us that we can learn from each other and we can build on the knowledge we gain working together. But I do think that we have to also keep pushing on the equity issue. Um, it's very unfortunate to me and disgraceful to uh, realize that there are the world is being kind of now fractured into the haves and the have-nots. Now we have the people who have access to COVID-19 vaccine or vaccines, multiple vaccines, and those who don't have access to any vaccine. And that's an untenable situation. It reminds me of the untenable situation in the early 2000s when people living with HIV in high resource countries had access to life-saving treatments and millions 
of people around the world had zero access to treatment. So I think we need to take that lesson learned and push very hard uh, to, um, to keeping in mind the importance of equity, the importance of working together, particularly when it comes to a pandemic, when it comes to an infectious disease and to do whatever we can to be selfless, to be sharing and, um, and to think of, uh, of the world as an interconnected entity rather than different countries with different borders around them. Thanks, Raf. I wanna give the last word to Sumya Swami Nathan, who may well uh, be speaking to the leaders at the high level meeting all the time anyway, but what are you, what are you, what's your message at this high level meeting? Well, a lot's been said already, John, but I think leaders need to think about what they need to do within their own countries. And that needs to be based on the local data and context. So key populations, you know, vulnerable groups, access to services, all these are different country by country. And so the policies need to be tailored. And from my own experience in India, clearly what works best is when community-based organizations, NGOs, and the most affected people are involved in the response and are involved in, uh, uh, in formulating the policies. So that is absolutely important at the national level. And this needs to change, of course, as scientific evidence comes in and you know, if, if new uh, strategies are shown to work better, then you have to adapt uh, your strategies and revise them. Uh, and we've seen that in COVID, we've been updating very regularly our guidelines uh, from the time that we started. At the global level, I also agree with the other speakers that we need some kind of a renewed mandate and a passion, perhaps. You said, John, that you've been saying this from 2000, no one paid any attention. But now we've actually got a proof of concept that when you come together and have a, a mission and build on all the scientific advances of the last decades, I mean, the mRNA platform, why can it not now be turned around very quickly for TB and HIV vaccines? And we know also that you can, uh, when you collaborate, that you can move much faster. And so I think we have to bring private and public sector together. There's huge amount of investments anyway into research from uh, public sector funds, but that must result also in, uh, in the benefits for, for public good. Thank well, I wanna, thank, I wanna thank all of you for uh, spending this time. And I think it's a fantastic diverse group um, so I compliment the organizers of this meeting as well. And uh, thank you all for taking the time out to share your thoughts. And thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good to see everyone. Bye-bye.